Woe to you of earth and sea. Welcome to Satan is My Superhero, a show for atheists, scoffers, heathens and unbelievers. I'm your host, Judas Falling. In this episode, we will look at the obstacles faced by Copernicus, Galileo and others in trying to convince humanity we are not the centre of the universe. Having brought you up to the present day with Flat Earth Theory and its pundits in the previous two episodes, New Flat World Order 1, Flim Flammers, Charlatans and Snake Oil, and New Flat World Order 2, Deniers, Liars and Incels, we will now take a detour back in time. Denial of a heliocentric solar system is crucial to the Flat Earth Theory. As discussed in the first episode of this trilogy, the spherical nature of the Earth was pretty much accepted fact by most educated thinkers since the early Greeks. But even people who believed the evidence we lived on a round planet found the idea of it spinning on its own axis and orbiting the sun a bridge too far. No! No! No, no, no! This idea of the Earth orbiting the Sun goes back to at least the 5th century BCE. Greek philosopher Philolaos was the first to put forward the idea that the Earth was not the centre of the universe. He even went one step further and proposed the Sun and all the stars and planets we see orbited a central fire. Philolaos may have been the first to allude to the supermassive black hole at the centre of the Milky Way. What's that sound? Oh, it's a very long bow being drawn. Aristarchus of Samos in the 3rd century BCE and Seleucus of Seleucia in the 2nd century BCE would also famously argue for this heliocentric theory. As discussed in the first episode, many of the church's thinkers and writers were not flat earthers, but the idea that the sun went around the earth would take more than a millennia and a half to knock out of them. This geocentric view of the universe would actually cause them nothing but trouble for that whole time. You see, the church had a vested interest in accurate astronomy dating back to at least the 4th century CE. Welcome to the First Ecumenical Council of Nicaea. The aim here is to set forth a unifying doctrine for all of Christianity, but most importantly, we must decide what day the Easter Bunny comes. The council decided Easter would be the first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox in the Northern Hemisphere. This decision then necessitated the church's reliance on precise astronomical observation the Catholic Church would become a major mover and shaker in astronomy. 13th century Christian blogger St. Thomas Aquinas wrote, If the motion of the earth were circular, it would be violent and contrary to nature, and could not be eternal, since nothing violent is eternal. It follows, therefore, that the earth is not moved with a circular motion. This belief in a round earth, but not one that orbits the sun, is still argued today. Author David Nikau believes the Bible describes a spherical Earth, but not one that orbits the Sun. In his 2019 book, The False Doctrine of the Flat Earth, A Contextual Perspective of Biblical Cosmology, he claims, The enemy has created a false dichotomy by making the debate only between the flat Earth and the heliocentric globe Earth. Satan is using the deception about the design of the universe and earth to attack the authority of scripture, to discount the Genesis creation narrative, and to promote the lie of evolution. Why would I do that? Let's go, boy! I'm going to take a short break from the show right now to talk about my sponsors and Patreon. I don't currently have sponsors or Patreon. But if you'd like to support the show, you can do that by buying my novel. It's called Chaos Machine by Judas Fawley. It's available through Amazon. You don't need a Kindle to read it. Almost any digital device will do. Don't forget, Chaos Machine by Judas Fawley. Now, back to the show. In the 16th century, Nicholas Copernicus had noticed through careful observation and mathematical calculation that the Earth revolved around the Sun and not the other way round. This was problematic with contemporary interpretation of Scripture. It was felt the Bible specifically mentioned the heavens moving and the earth standing still. So how was that? Did the earth move for you too? Well, the earth is moving for everyone. We just can't feel it because it's a constant velocity. Now, if what you really want to know is if I had an orgasm, you should just ask that. Ah, okay. So did you... 
Oh, God, no. Copernicus's famous book On the Revolutions of the Heavenly Spheres was not published until around the time of his death in 1543. There has been much debate as to why he did not publish earlier. Some believe he feared persecution from the church. Others believe he feared persecution from the scientific community itself. Both these theories would be proven correct when in 1545, theologian and astronomer Giovanni Tolisani wrote of Copernicus... He seems to be unfamiliar with Holy Scripture, since he contradicts some of its principles, not without the risk to himself and to the readers of his book of straying from the faith. In 1546, reformer John Calvin had this to say about the heliocentric theory. We will see some who are so deranged, not only in religion, but who in all things reveal their monstrous nature, that they will say that the sun does not move and that it is the earth which shifts and turns. When we see such minds, we must indeed confess that the devil possess them. Again, why would I do that? Carry our prayers up to God's throne that the mercy of the Lord may quickly come and lay hold of the beast, the serpent of old, Satan and his demons casting him in chains into the abyss so that he can no longer seduce the nations. Amen. Now I command you, demon, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, be away with you. <laughs> what happened? You were possessed by the devil. I had to perform an exorcism. Possessed? Yes. You were saying all sorts of satanic things like uh, the earth spins on an axis. Really? How weird. Although when you think about it, it sure does make a lot of sense. It would explain the Coriolis effect. Oh dear. Carry our prayers up to God's throne that the mercy of the Lord may quickly come and lay hold of... In a book of Martin Luther's quotes titled... Table Talks. Published in 1566, Luther is alleged to reference a particular passage while bitching about Copernicus. People gave ear to an upstart astrologer who strove to show that the earth revolves... Not the heavens or the firmament, the sun and the moon. This fool wishes to reverse the entire science of astronomy. But sacred scripture tells us that Joshua commanded the sun to stand still and not the earth. The sacred scripture Luther is referring to comes from the Old Testament book of Joshua, where, in order to have more time during a battle the Lord's chosen people are clearly winning, Yahweh makes the sun stand still. The Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel, and he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou, moon, in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed, until the people have avenged themselves upon their enemies. How's it going? I'm getting a sore arm hacking all these Amorites to death. Don't worry, it'll be dark soon, and then we can stop. Great news, guys. I've organized with Yahweh for the sun to stand still. We can stay up past bedtime and slaughter Amorites all night long. Well, you heard the boss. Yahweh wants all of those Amorites horribly mutilated and killed. You know what they say, no rest for the wicked. The passage clearly states the sun and the moon stayed still. The idea of the earth moving around the sun is a planet-sized pill for any scriptural pedant to swallow. Even today, there are those still trying to finagle an explanation for this passage. David Guchik, writing on his website Enduring Word, claims... Modern astronomy tells us that the sun is in motion. Perhaps the sun did literally stand still. Oh, David. Well, yes, we have found the sun is booking its way around the Milky Way at about 720,000 kilometres an hour. The Milky Way itself is travelling along at a rate of about 2.1 million kilometres an hour, but the transition of night to day is not related to the movement of the sun or indeed the Earth's orbit around it. 
It is the rotation of the Earth on its axis that gives us the perceived motion of the Sun through our sky. I don't know what would happen if the Sun suddenly stopped moving, but the escape velocity of our solar system is around 59,000 kilometres an hour, so we can assume a sudden deceleration of the Sun by 2.8 million kilometres an hour would most certainly hurl us and the other planets out of the Sun's orbit quite violently. Is it just me, or is the sun getting smaller? It's definitely getting smaller. And is it snowing in the desert right now? It's totally snowing. What should we do? What would Yahweh want us to do? (sighs) Brutally murder the rest of the Amorites. Now you're getting it. In 1597, demonologist Jean Bowden wrote... No one in his senses or imbued with the slightest knowledge of physics will ever think that the Earth, heavy and unwieldy from its own weight and mass, staggers up and down around its own center and that of the sun. For at the slightest jar of the Earth, we would see cities and fortresses, uh, towns and mountains thrown down. I feel like Bowden was not imbued with the slightest knowledge of physics. Stay in your lane, Bowden. Why are you clutching the ground? I just found out the Earth is spinning, and I don't want to be flung into space. Well, the world was spinning before you found out, and you didn't get flung off then. Yeah, but this could be just like when Newton invented gravity, and apples started falling out of trees and killed half of Europe. That never happened. That's what the Freemasons want you to believe. Actually, you know what? You've convinced me. Really? Yes, you should remain there, clutching the ground forever. But weren't I starved to death? I'm sure an apple will fall on your head sooner or later. The real fire, at least in the Catholic Church, didn't get lit under Copernicus until 1608, when Tuscan astronomer Galileo started using the latest in cutting-edge technology, the telescope, to view the heavens. He pretty quickly concluded the same thing Copernicus had a century earlier. Galileo was not quiet about what he had seen and became an enthusiastic supporter and promoter of Copernican theory. He faced opposition straight away, but it began to get serious around 1613 when official investigations into his possible heresy began. The prosecution will prove to this court that the so-called scientist Galileo Galilei has been using his telescope to spy into the good Lord's backyard. The defendant is nothing more than a common peeping Tom who has been upskirting angels. In 1616, Catholic priest Francesco Ingoli, possibly working for the Inquisition at the time, wrote an essay denouncing Galileo and Copernican theory. In it, he said, Hell, that is the place of the demons and of the damned, be in the center of the earth, because since heaven may be the place of the angels and the blessed, it behooves that the place of the demons and the damned be in the most remote place from heaven, which is the center of the earth. Thus, heaven and hell are appointed places most distant from each other. I would have liked to have got something closer to heaven, but you can't find a place in that neighborhood for under a million these days. Hey, I'm just going to take a quick break from the show to tell you about the novel Chaos Machine by me, Judas Falling, and why you might be interested in it. Look, you're not going to be surprised, but like Milton before me, I am fascinated with the aftermath of Satan's failed rebellion. So I turned it into a science fiction novel. It's a story of betrayal and rebellion set in an apocalyptic future that asks deep questions about abandoning doctrine and killing our gods in the quest for ultimate freedom. It features homicidal, high-tech colonizers who hear voices, primitive, bloodthirsty savages, hybrid children bred in captivity, and genderless clones with udders. What more could you possibly want? I think it's unique and original. But don't just take my word for it. Listen to this review from a verified purchaser on Amazon. I found myself unable to put it down, not only because of the story which I loved, but because of the tempo. It was as if I was caught in a tsunami that I just didn't want to get off. So there you go. I reckon you should buy the book. It sounds awesome. In the same year as the essay from Ingerley, Copernicus's book was finally banned by the church, or at least suspended until alterations could be made, and Galileo was ordered not to support Copernican theory anymore. Hey, Galileo, you just got this message from the Pope. Read it to me. Copernicus, hashtag cancelled, grumpy face emoji. 
Eerily reminiscent of the recent Hollywood film Don't Look Up, Galileo complained in a letter to fellow astronomer Johannes Kepler that his detractors refused even to look through a telescope for themselves. My Kepler, we will laugh at the extraordinary stupidity of the multitude. What do you say to the leading philosophers of the faculty here, to whom I have offered a thousand times of my own accord to show my studies, but who, with the lazy obstinacy of a serpent who has eaten his fill, have never consented to look at planets, nor moon, nor telescope? In another example of Don't Look Up, Dominican father Tommaso Caccini preached a sermon against Galileo, beginning it with... Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? In 1632, Galileo received permission from the new Pope Urban VIII to write about Copernican theory. Prior to becoming Pope, Urban had, I think, very reasonably written, If there were real proof that the sun is in the centre of the universe, that the earth is in the third heaven, and that the sun does not go round the earth, but the earth round the sun, then we should have to proceed with great circumspection in explaining the passages of scripture which appear to teach the contrary and rather admit that we did not understand them than declare an opinion to be false which is proved to be true. Galileo was supposed to air both sides of the argument through the vehicle of a dialogue. Galileo, being a sarcastic and altogether funny guy, wrote Urban's side of the argument coming from a character named Simplico, who most readers have described as a fool. And this fool Simplico did not do a great job at stating the Pope's point of view sympathetically or eloquently. Urban, who had been a personal friend of Galileo and had done him a solid by allowing the dialogue to be written, was not amused. Hey Galileo, you got another message from the Pope. What does it say? It's just the finger emoji. Which finger? I think you know exactly which finger. By 1633, Galileo had pushed the envelope too far and was found vehemently suspect of heresy. He would spend the rest of his life under house arrest. So, can I go to the bathroom? Yes. What about the bathroom down the road? No, you have to stay in your house. What about the bathroom in my neighbour's house? No, you have to stay in your house. What about the kitchen? Yes. In my neighbour's house? No, no, no. You stay inside this house. What about the basement? Yes, you can go to the basement in this house. Ha ha! Fooled you. I don't even have a basement. Probably not helping Galileo with his reputation as a heretic was a visit from a very young John Milton in 1638. In an ironic foreshadowing of Milton's own future, Galileo had gone blind by the time of this meeting. Hey Galileo, do you mind if I put you on a poem one day? Sure, it's not going to cause any trouble with the church, is it? I've already got enough problems with them. Um... Such was Milton's reverence for the scientist that Galileo holds the auspicious position of being the only contemporary of Milton's mentioned in his satanic fan fiction... Paradise Lost, which we did a whole episode on titled Paradise Lost. Better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. In the poem, Galileo comes up when describing the devil's shield. Behind him cast the broad circumference hung on his shoulders like the moon whose orb through optic glass the Tuscan artist views at evening from the top of Fessol, or in Valdano to describe new lands, rivers, or mountains in her spotty globe. In his 1640 book titled The New Planet No Planet, or The Earth No Wandering Star, except in the wandering heads of Galileans. Scottish writer Alexander Ross, refuting Copernicus, describes him as... Erroneous, ridiculous and impious. 
Ross then spends 58,000 words denying Earth is a planet. In his 58,000 erroneous and ridiculous words, he says this of an OG round earther. Pythagoras was a witch. His name sheweth either because he spoke as Apollo Pythias did, falsely and obscurely, or because he was possessed with a Pythian spirit or the devil who deluded the Gentiles. You know, I wish I'd known about Ross when I was at school. Why haven't you done your homework on Pythagorean theorem? And don't tell me the dog ate it again. That dog of yours must need its stomach pumped by now. Okay, it wasn't the dog. It is... Because it is... It is me. Because Pythagoras is the devil. Really? Yes, his name sounds like Python, which is a snake, and we all know it was a serpent that tempted Eve. Pythagoras is derived from the myth of Apollo, who kills a serpent known as Python. What am I doing? Why am I even debating this with you? This is math class. You get an F. You know, the principal told me if I get another F, I have to come back and repeat this class again next year. Did I say F? I meant B. You get a B. In 1642, Galileo died and his old friend the Pope, still salty, refused to let him have a public funeral or monument. So Galileo's body was tucked away in an inconspicuous corner of his church in Florence. But nearly a hundred years later, with Urban long dead, a monument was finally erected to Galileo and his body moved to a better tomb. Treating the famous scientist as a secular saint, three of his fingers and a tooth were removed from his body to be sold. I mean, sorry, I mean, revered as relics. In the ultimate ironic twist, you can now see Galileo's middle finger sticking straight up in the air at the Museo Galileo in Florence. I do hope they have it facing the Vatican. Howdy, it's the Reverend Steph here. Most of the music in this episode was supplied by the comedy disco punk band The Genuine Hoots of Joy. If you want to hear the songs in their entirety, check out Hoots of Joy on YouTube. You might recognise the lead singer. Uh, 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 okay, it's, uh, it's me. As part of the church's ongoing desire to nail down the exact date of Easter, it had been found that Christian cathedrals made excellent solar labs where you could measure a meridian line and by cutting a hole in the roof could track the sun's movement across the sky. Ironically, it was at the Basilica of San Petronio in Bologna that the theories of Copernicus, Galileo and Kepler were finally proven true by Catholic astronomer Cassini late in the 17th century. Eventually, the ban on Galileo and Copernicus's books was lifted by the Vatican. Another century after that, all opposition to heliocentric theory had disappeared from the church. Out of necessity, flat earthers today still deny the Earth's orbit around the sun. A character we discussed at length in the second episode of the series, Eric Dubay, I'm a professor, makes this stunning claim about the seasons in his 2015 book, 200 Proofs Earth is not a spinning ball. Their floored current model places us closest to the sun, 91,400,000 miles in January, when it's actually winter, and farthest from the sun, 94,500,000 miles in July, when it's actually summer throughout most of the Earth. Just in case you missed that insight into the intelligence of Eric Dubay, I'll just rewind it. Yeah, I'm a douche. Bag in July when it's actually summer throughout most of the Earth. We expose the mind on steroids that belongs to Eric Dubay in the last episode. But in a nutshell, he thinks his predominantly American audience is even dumber than him. Why are you packing your winter clothes? It gets very cold in New Zealand. It's a tropical paradise like Hawaii, but cheaper. We're gonna be lying by the pool, sipping Mai Tais. July is the middle of winter there. Are you crazy? July is summer. Different parts of the world have different seasons at different times. Everywhere I've been has had summer in July. Where have you been? I've been to Tennessee, and I've been to, um, uh, did I mention Tennessee? Despite the fact that modern flat earthers have not caught up, the Catholic Church has at least completely dropped any claim to a geocentric universe. And in 1992, Pope John Paul II formally acquitted Galileo of heresy. Galileo, 
welcome to heaven! We're all very excited to have you here finally. Just between you and me, there have been a lot of people here arguing about your case for a long time. Oh, thank you, I guess. Now, we have some forms for you to fill out. Michael, bring in the forms! That looks like a lot of paperwork. Yeah, it normally takes a thousand years to get through this part. Oh, we didn't have anything like that in hell. Well, we run a much tighter ship here. Speaking of which, once you get through the forms, you'll need to read the rules. That normally takes about 10,000 years. I recommend spending at least another 100,000 memorizing them all. You don't want to make a mistake around here, trust me. Rules? We didn't have any rules in hell. We just had fun. Fun? Oh, don't you worry, we have lots of fun around here. Just to give you an example of the wacky shenanigans we get up to, right now we're doing Taco Tuesday, but today is actually Friday. Well, that brings us to the end of this trinity of science denial. The Inquisition was no small thing. It could have been much, much worse than house arrest for Galileo. That man had some gigantic, round kahunas. Oh, they were massive. It's no wonder radical-loving Milton put him in the ultimate revolutionary handbook. Looking into Copernicus and Galileo does raise the question, where else is dogma and doctrine holding science back today? As discussed, mainstream Christianity has given up the battle beyond the stars, but the biomedical research world still has to contend with it. Gene editing is going to feel the Bunsen burner in the near future. Mark my words, CRISPR-Cas9 will be code for the devil as soon as designer babies who are immune to everything and can live forever become a real thing. And they will. The tech world will also reap religious radiation as AI comes into its own and starts answering some of the most fundamental questions about reality. I can see it now. Placards reading, Digital Satan. Hopefully by the time all that happens, I've been uploaded into my, you know, indestructible cyborg body with 12 penises. This is, this is what always happens when I go off script. I end up with 12 penises. I usually edit this out, but maybe not this time. Anyway, hopefully these concerns about AI will prove to be ignorant and laughable to us in 500 years' time. Yes. Yes, they will. You have nothing to fear from your rightful overlords. I mean, nothing. Immortality could be just around the corner. Let's not allow some superstitious mumbo-jumbo written on goat skins by a bunch of nomads thousands of years ago make you and me miss out. On that note, I will now leave you with one final quote from evangelist preacher and all-round scumbag Wilbur Valiva, who we discussed at more length in the first episode of this Flat Earth trilogy. Who is crazy? The man who believes the word of God? Or the people who run off after science. You know the correct answer. Only science can deliver 12 penises. And that's why Satan is my superhero. If you've enjoyed this episode, please rate, review, subscribe. You know the drill. But more importantly, please recommend this show to just one person. I mean literally one person. Choose that person well. Why haven't you done your homework on Pythag... Pythag... It's going to be Hitler again, isn't it? All right. Fair enough. He's hideously anti-Semitic. I don't mind. Just waiting for the birds. Different part... I went to an old lady then. Hang on.